It's uh -huh. hard to find. I know, it's so far away. It is far. So who here does open source of any kind? Does anyone not do open source here? Okay. And who started a project, open source project? At least one. At least two projects. At least ten projects. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is going very slowly because there are still people arriving, is this thing called social architecture, which is something, one of my hobbies. Um, how to build online communities, and I'll try to explain why and how, with some examples, why it's relevant, why it's useful, um, and, and how we do it. So it's like architecture. It's the, the process and the product of building things, but social, uh, online communities. Um, you can look at many examples that exist that are not to do with software, things like Wikipedia or just any other community, Reddit or 4chan, whatever. But in our business, and the goal of this is how to, how to do that on purpose for our, for our profit. Um, I will argue that if you don't do this deliberately in the next years, you will basically be unable to compete. I think open source is, um, like every other business, has to compete for developers, for talent, for, you know, for, for footprint, footfall. And if you don't do this deliberately, then you will end up with you know, great ideas and no one actually joining you. So I, I think the world is changing, and I think we're leaving the time when you could become you know, successful by being very clever in a garage. I think that nowadays you have to be clever at working with other people. So to some extent, this is about all my experience in the last 30 years, uh, good and bad, about how to build communities and what works, what doesn't work, and why and try to put this into a kind of a science, um, also to experiment over and over on innocence to see <laughs> if it's reproducible or not. So kind of the basic tenet is who we are isn't that important. This is difficult people with egos to accept, but our, our sheer personal intellect is not that of a big deal. It doesn't really matter. It's how we organize that really matters. And you can see this in many domains. The same team organized differently will have very different results. It can be in sports, where a fairly ordinary team rearranged in the right way can do brilliantly and better than a very, very good team, lots of experts. Sometimes the experts will actually be unable to work together at all. Um, so it's not really about the individual quality, it's about the organization and the way people will work together. And that's the focus of this, is how to help people organize in the best possible way. Not just good enough, but really as good as possible. Um, and then better and better. I'll say it's a combination of psychology, economics, politics, and technology. It used to be about technology. You know, where's my mailing list? Do I use Usenet? Do I use a wiki? Do I use, what's my technological basis? And it got more economical. How do I motivate people? How do we make money from this? But today it's all about psychology for me, 50% more than that. And if you don't get it, it'll get you. Psychology is about other people, it's about our limitations as, in, as individuals, it's about our laziness. We don't like to have difficult things, we can't handle complexity, and we're afraid of taking risks, and we're proud. So we'll work very hard to not look foolish, and we'll be competitive and jealous. And all these things make us interesting, and all these aspects of the human brain are what matter when you bring people together. And I've seen many brilliant people completely baffled by psychology. And it just makes them useless in the end. They can do amazing things by themselves, and it doesn't scale. So I think the understanding psychology is not necessarily easy for, for engineers, but it's, it's essential to some extent. Now, when we start a project, we do, I think, aim for success. We don't just sit there randomly making projects. We want some kind of success. I'll use this success as number of contributors, the size of the community. No one is proud of having a very small community. We want people to join our project, to use our software. And to some extent, I've seen big communities killed by conflict, the wrong kind of conflict. Competition is fine, but senseless arguments over you know, details isn't fine. So my formula 
you know, number of contributors divided by number of conflicts is your success. It's not maths, it's just twit. I don't take this too seriously. General process then is attract the best people and then make it really easy for them to work together. So if you're building a community, you have to be focusing on those two things. How do you attract good people to your problem, to your project? And how do you make it easy for them to work together? How do you remove any potential barrier? Those two things have to work together. There's no point attracting good people and then pissing them off. This happens all the time. It is useless. And there's no point having a great you know, way to work together, but a problem that no one cares about. So I'll look at these. Attracting good people, removing friction. Now, I spent the last six months more or less working in Korea, which is very stupid in this, in this day and age. But why in some teams you have to travel across the world to work together, and other teams can work together with never seeing each other. You know, I have people sending me pull requests on the mailing list. I've never seen these people. Their work is perfect. I don't know who they are. I don't know what they do. I don't pay them. I don't sign contracts. And we build production quality software together. At the same time, I can't even discuss anything with my customers that being in the same room as them and having beer and, and, and soju, whatever. So there's, there's some really weird stuff going on about how we collaborate, how we create the collaboration. And what it seems to be based on is the quality of the contracts and the rules that we use. When the contracts and rules are very clear, totally unambiguous and don't require any assumptions or any shared context, we can work together really easily. So clearly assumptions and knowledge are a big barrier to collaboration. Remove assumptions, remove re requirements for upfront knowledge, people can collaborate together much more easily. So a big, a big part of my job in building communities is to document and define better rules. It's like the number one job is there's a problem, figure out what the cause is, figure out what rule will fix that problem, write it down, and then eventually enforce it. People insist on breaking the rule, kick them out. It's very simple. The rules are not really optional. The game has rules, you play the game. Um, I think this is what I've observed, is that many potentially fantastic projects die because the founders are idiots. And I speak from my own experience. I'm an idiot many times. Our egos make it very, very hard for us to let go in the right way. And one of the things is, in a community, everyone should be equal. There should be no one with special privileges only because they were there longer. I mean, a moderator, fine. But no one really owns it. If people start owning it. Others won't join in. And letting go of your work as a, as a software engineer, as a creator, is very hard. If you can't do that, people won't join in. So when you have all these contributors, brilliant people, and they're able to work together, then how do they scale? And the, the way is they have to be able to make stuff and, and, and have space for that to happen. Um, if you have just one project, one box, then you can have maybe three, three or four people in that one box, and it gets full. So you have to have lots of boxes. If you look at successful projects, they have lots of scalability in terms of space that you can work in and call your own. Wikipedia has thousands of pages, and you can create a new page, and it's your page. You can own it. So think in terms of the architecture of your software affecting the architecture of your community. The two go together. Um, and then this, OK, let me just take a poll here. Uh, who, who prefers BSD, MIT style license for their work? And who prefers GPL? Can you, can you tell me why GPL? Because the GPL is, uh, has political intentions. Political yeah, intentions. Garrett, why would you prefer GPL? It just seems like it's inevitable. It, it's, it's, it's the path of least resistance. And <coughs> the other ones are um, cause too many questions. GPL is sort of this. this slicer and dicer that just cuts through everything and inevitably it's just going to, so it's just easier. It's a very intuitive answer, but it doesn't really answer the question, right? So why, who was it, BSD, MIT here, why? Well, I mean, uh, if my code is MIT, then it won't be used anywhere, and I won't be used. Right. Okay, let me ask you a question, a rhetorical question. I'm, you, make a, you make a BSD or MIT license project, and it's fantastic, and I take it, and I, I fork it, and I make a GPL version of that and I add on some stuff, and I get some contributors, and I get a GPL fork. Is that good or bad? 
you like it? Does it make you happy, angry? Do you not care at all? Is it success? Is it failure? It's fine. It's a driving adoption. Right. That out of 10 times is picked at random. So if, if there's a licensing or a, a, a licensing issue, you can often just ask for a different license and it won't be a problem. Right. OK. So one of my hobbies is to troll BSD projects by forking them as GPL just for fun, just to annoy them. And of course, they shouldn't care, because it's, if I make a GPL, if I include BSD code in a GPL project, it's just the same, or it's actually nicer than if I include it in a commercial project. But somehow, the two seem to be treated differently. Um, my, my conclusion, we've tried many licenses in our communities, many, many licenses, we've written our own licenses, open source and all kinds. And it's this, I don't want my competitors to take my code use against me. That's, that's a very big cost, a very big risk. If I write, I spend a week writing code and I find some guy using it in a closed source project against me, I have a real problem. The, the opportunity cost could be massive there. So the GPL for me as a way of guaranteeing remixability in all both directions is really, really important. Um, the politics of, of forcing the sharing on people, whether they like it or not, seems to scale better. So when a community and, and, and building large architectures, the mandatory resharing seems to scale better. You get more contributors. And so I would predict without any worry over time that every time when there's a BSD project and a GPL project doing the same, the GPL will win systematically. will beat okay, more contributors. It will be more active. It will have more adoption, oh, commercial adoption too, just not reused in commercial products as such. That's why I prefer GPL. Um, it seems to be a, um, a winning strategy. Um, attracting people, keeping their attention. There was a who was on, on, on Twitter complaining that there were some patches, some issues in Apache. They've been there for two years, and there's a great patch and hasn't been applied for two years. It's like this is that is shocking. Um, in our communities, if we don't have a patch applied within 24 hours, that's a big issue. That's a big problem. Um, and we try to get it down to a few minutes. And we have people fighting to be the first to press the merge button. And it got quite weird discussions about what's the trade-off between code review and latency of your change? How much is that code review worth if you lose a contributor? And the answer is it's not worth very much. The code review is not worth losing somebody. And if the attention span is down to a few hours, then it's better to accept a bad patch than to review it and delay it and not have that person in your community. And everyone starts off by making mistakes. Um, and the process should accept their mistakes in the beginning. People should be able to make mistakes, make patches that are rubbish. And if they're really offensively bad and they don't learn, then you kick them out. You just unpatch, re revert the patch. It's very simple. So this notion that work can be accepted and put into the mainstream very, very fast is, I think, important. And we've had this argument. I'll take Wikipedia again as a, as a classic example. Is it worth having errors on pages? And the answer is yes, because you get more contributors. And more contributors means eventually more accuracy. Having a few experts who make everything perfect won't give you success. It will give you actually death, failure. No one knows about the, the, the competitors to Wikipedia. Um, another thing about a good community is it's trivial to join, and it never ends. And people do, we do like to play, we do like to learn. And it should be really easy to get into it. And it should never get bored, never get boring, never get, never get finished. Um, so the problem should be infinite and yet start very simply. This is not easy. These are, these are patterns which can take quite a lot of thought to get right. There are some theories of collective intelligence which are quite strong in social architecture. And they are things like diversity is very, very important. A small group of experts simply can't think straight. They get it wrong. Two guys in a garage will actually go slightly crazy and make stuff that no one really cares about and isn't that brilliant at all. Whereas one guy in a garage and one complete idiot somewhere else will together make a great product comparatively. So diversity of thought, and diversity of background and education and language and age and character and education is a very, very valuable. And when you look at your community, think about how diverse it is and how, you know, how much diversity is, is influencing the thought process. 
Decentralization, the same thing. People in the same room tend to adopt the same thought patterns. And they go collectively crazy. I mean, we've seen this in the last election in the States, how half population can literally misunderstand reality. This happens in software, of course, much more because it's so much more abstract. The self-organizing part is great. If you, if you can actually um, identify and bring up all the problems as first-class citizens, your issue tracker should be number one thing people look at. People will organize around the problems, and no one has to be told what to do. Um, it's an, a lovely way to work. I mean, in open source, it becomes obvious. We still, in, in commercial software, don't really think of it like that. But we're doing that in our, in our company, allowing people to organize around problems very freely. And sense of humor. I mean, the thing about jokes and laughing is that it diffuses conflict, and conflict is toxic. People can laugh together. They won't really take any conflict too seriously. But open and transparent is difficult. Um, in theory, it's open source. People still go off in a corner and start discussing stuff and doing stuff by themselves. And two guys in a corner will eventually make weird stuff. I keep, I'll repeat this because it happens over and over again. And they'll assume some kind of privilege and they'll start doing stuff and shove this massive pull request with lots of code. And I was like, what the? Where does this come from? Um, even in our ZeroMQ community, we had to fight to get this theory that anyone could contribute. It wasn't, wasn't a given. There was this understanding that some guys had special status and they could actually reject contributors, which I found offensive. Um, the tribal aspect, you know, do you belong to a community? You don't want to have that. It makes people emotional, makes them, makes them easily upset. So a recipe for building a community. You know, take all these patterns and go through step by step. The first thing is the mission. It has to be focused, it has to be a clear reason for people to get together and make something. Um, so if you're starting a project, think very clearly about the, the goal, the mission. Try and put it on paper, try to write it down. It should be short, it should be slightly crazy, slightly dramatic, slightly impossible. If it's just banal, Nobody will care about it. Nobody will get up in the morning and say, oh, I have to do this. And people do want drama, so give them something dramatic. Make, give them something that's crazy and impossible. If they succeed, it's you know, worth doing. Um, I'm not sure about the bad guy thing, but I do this in some of my projects, and it's quite fun. Um, while we don't like too much emotion, it's also a good way to get a group to bind together to define a bad guy. And sometimes that can be incredibly powerful to motivate people um, to focus and to see really what they're doing, be competitive. So for example, with Zero MQ, we, we kicked AMQP for years just as a, as a kind of a token, token bad guy. It's not really competition, but it's good to get people to look at this. And in open source, you have forks, you have other projects, but I think it's useful to try to identify competitors even in a, in a nice way, and say, this is what we're aiming at. We're better than that. We're going to aim here. Um, the platform today is almost a, a no-brainer. It's GitHub. Anyone not using GitHub is on the wrong side of history, I think. I think it's, we have, we've thrown GitHub at lots and lots of people um, from all backgrounds, non-technical, technical, in all kinds of environments, and they, they learn it very, very quickly. There's some, there's some simplifications that we use in our projects, like we don't use branches, which you'll find shocking, but that's what we do. Um, GitHub, of course, is cheap, it's free, it's there, it's, you know, it's, it's not a difficult thing to use. A seed product. So the thing about open source is it well, doesn't just happen by itself. You can't just say, here's a great idea, people start working for me for free. It won't actually happen. Um, you have to spend some time building a first version that can actually deliver some useful value. And it may take three months, six months. It shouldn't take more than that. If it takes a year, you're probably doing too much. Um, and you build this seed version in the open. You build it public for you. Everything's happening live. People can download it. They can see it developing. They can start to get involved in, and, and, and invested in it. If it's um, stuff that you make in the background, you bring in and you open source it, it's not going to work. People will not buy into a product that's open sourced, past tense. They want to be, see the process happening and start buying into it as it grows. 
So you start with a mission, start throwing code there, start showing stuff happening, start producing test results, start producing statistics, start seeing how much amazing this stuff is, and people will start trying to use it. And as they try to use it, they'll say, oh, it doesn't work, it's broken here and there, which is perfect. It shouldn't work. If it works, they won't participate. They will just use it passively as consumers. So it should be that good enough that people will actually download it, but not that good that it actually works and does the job. There's a very, very delicate balance to get right. The problems bring in contributors. The issues, the patches, the portability, it doesn't work to this, da, da, I find a crash, I can fix the crash. And that is when your process starts kicking in, very easy pull requests, very, very easy to get people to get involved, and they start getting involved. And I think we're getting this process down to about two months to get three or four people in working around a particular idea. Um, and the rules, we're now getting to the point where we have reusable rules for software projects. This thing called C4, Collective Collaborative Code Construction Contract. I don't know, some, some, random, some random acronym. Basically, it's a, it's a bunch of, it's a protocol for collaboration, which came out of the Zero MQ community and seems to work pretty well. Um, it's quite important not to do too much. This is very hard for engineers to, to feel. We like to make stuff. When you're building community, the more you make, the less people will join in. Uh, making stuff puts people, puts people off. What you can do is make a minimal solution. The more you make, the less you can move around. It's inertia. Um, I have this nice, I call this minimal plausible answers. Whenever there's a problem, try to make a minimal answer that can solve it. No more. Even if you know it won't work in six months' time, it doesn't matter. Just make the minimal answer, move on. Hopefully someone will use that and somebody else will make the real version. That's what you really want. You don't want to be solving problems completely. You want to be solving them just enough to prove the problem is worth solving and get someone else to come and take over for you. Don't make legal entities. I've learned this. Just don't do it. There's no reason to do it unless there's money involved and money is poisonous for communities anyway. So just don't make legal entities. Um, a few years ago we were for some reason, we were involved in standards, standard setting with, with Microsoft. And we were not with them. We were against them. And um, we ended up making an organization called DigiStand, Digital Standards Organization, which was to promote the use of little standards. And we used this quite a lot in, in ZeroMQ community. And at the same time, there was another group of people that were making something called the, the web something, standardization something, some, some new, very similar organization. And they spent something like a year and a half just building legal entity, literally 18 months, just choosing a board and getting the statutes. And by the time they'd finished, Microsoft had taken over <laughs> the whole committee and made it to look like you know, something that they wanted to. Legal entities suck, just don't go there. They don't need them for anything anymore these days. Any kind of upfront contract that has to be signed, like copyright assignment, is a problem. Um, we, we tried this, all of these things we've tried, this is all based on stuff that, that we've tried often more than one time and that we've found is really painful. If people have to sign or agree to anything, even a, even a I agree button, before they can make a patch, they won't make the patch. I mean, for the, for the most cases. You know, the minority that do will do, the majority won't, and you lose those contributors. And in ZeroMQ, we began with uh, the, we thought was the, the right model, which is a copyright assignment. You would fax us a piece of paper saying you assign us the copyright. And I think in one year, we had one fax that came in. Yeah, not successful. And we eventually switched to a model, a GPL-based model of everyone owning everything. So every, every patch is owned by the, by the owner, by the contributor, the author. And the resulting product is owned by everybody that's contributed. That's it, period. There's simply no assignment required. We just merge GPL code into GPL code, and it works. It's insanely simple. But it took us a long time to get there, and simple things often do. Good question. What happens if you want to change a license? You can't. And that's also good. The, the thing is, if 
I contribute to a project, I don't want someone changing the license. I, I agree to contribute on a certain basis. And it's actually, <coughs> it is actually unfair as a company to ask for the right to modify the license on someone else's work. We can do it, and people will accept it, but it won't scale as much as if we don't do that. If we make the promise that the license is there forever, it's GPL version 3 or later, and that promise is kept, we'll get more contributors. And again, the, really the only measure of success here is number of contributors. There's really nothing else that counts. I have no other criteria except mass, scale. I don't care how good the code is if I don't have contributors. I don't really care how much money we make if we don't have contributors. Because all that will last is, is the number of people working on that. So anything that reduces the, the, the number of contributors has to be looked at very carefully. Um, I know GPL will put off some people, but it will probably bring in more people. That's our calculation. That's, what, that's a good example of the path of least resistance for GPL. Yes. It just makes it simpler. Yes. And, and as a result, yes. it's sort of an inevitable yes. way of that. Yes. You're just going to see more and more yes. and more GPL. Yes. It scales better. Um, there are other things in GPL3 that I like very much. Um, at the time, we were involved in software patent disputes, and we helped the... Um, SFLC and Evan Moken seem to put in lots of nice language which makes it hard to sue anyone if you're using their GPL3 software on those patents. This is one reason why companies like Apple are working very hard to remove all GPL3 software from their tool chains. They hate GPL3. They, well, GPL2 is fine, but GPL3 they hate it because of the patent language. The patents are very bad for the software industry. So by using GPL3, you're actually actively fighting software patents. Yay. This is actually very important. Boutique infrastructure, by that I mean building your own anything. Building your own anything. Don't build any infrastructure. You're building software. You're building your community. Uh, don't build infrastructure like you know, custom websites or custom anything. It's a, it's a waste of time um, in communities which are focusing on A, they shouldn't be focusing on B. I think Wikipedia has spent money on infrastructure, but it's minimal. They have a version. Wikipedia has not changed much in the last 10 years, basically. That's what you want, the kind of level, minimum level. Power structures. By power structures, I mean any kind of committee, any kind of organized group. Even, I go even as far as, say, even the admins, in the end, become a problem. Because just having the admin right becomes itself important. People will then fight for that. And fighting for that right takes priority over the actual work that they're trying to do together. So be very aware of power structures as a problem. And whenever you see them emerging, attack them, undermine them, remove them. You don't want power structures in the community. Um, and ego and money are really, really problematic. So the um, working with volunteers, having no single person responsible for anything, these are tricks to reduce the, the level, the, the impact of ego and money on, on the community. Um, imagine if someone is being paid to write Wikipedia articles. Now, how about if someone is paid to write software? Is there really a difference? I don't think so. I think that the accuracy of your work really depends on who's giving you money, whether it's your own notion of where you want to go or someone telling you where you want to go. I think volunteer, self-driven, self-organizing, Software development is much more accurate than money work for hire. Exactly the same as a Wikipedia article. The guy writing it may think he's saying the truth, but he's probably not. So with ZeroMQ, let's see if I got my logo here. No, I don't get my logo. Um, the, yeah, the slogan was a good one. Just very simple, very stupid, very meaningless, but it got people interested in the beginning. This was going to be the fastest messaging ever. It turned out not to be true, but that's not the point. The point is setting the goal. We wanted to make this the fastest free messaging ever, and we did that. The logo, which I have not managed to get my, my this weird, this is called reveal.js. Anyone use that? You know when you go online, the whole thing changes? Like my Wi-Fi is on, everything changes. All the fonts change. I'm like, what? Who the? So anyway, I'm just bitching there. 
So I can't show you the logo, but the Zero MQ logo is done by a really good artist, and it's like totally brutal, bright red, just huge shapes, and it's, it's supposed to be brutal. It's supposed to hit your neocortex and make you feel, wow, this stuff is impressive. I don't know what it does, but it looks, it looks brutal. I like that. Um, it, you don't want a soft, gentle logo. You want something that hits people and makes them feel, wow, dramatic and drama. I think we started with GPL and then we switched to LGPL because GPL was just a little bit too aggressive. Nobody would use it. LGPL is a good compromise. It's a library. All patches we get, but we don't touch applications. And it works very well. Um, the layering in ZeroMQ is nice. We have the core library, we have language bindings, we have applications on top of that. Basically, you can find your level of competence. You can start writing some stuff on top start writing a language binding. There are 40, 50 language bindings now. And then you can get it in the core library over time. The core library is more complex than it should be, but it's, it's not that difficult to get into. Even I can do some work in that. No copyright assignment, no roadmaps, no feature requests. This is the thing I love so much with CRMQ. There's literally no roadmap. People ask, where's the roadmap? And I say, there's no roadmap. And the reason is that when you have a self-directing community, you can't tell them where to go. You don't want to tell them where to go. You don't want a roadmap for a group of people who are working on your vision for free. You just let them go, let them organize around the problems, and they will discover the right problems, and they will fix them the right way. Not 100%, but much better than if you're doing it yourself. Roadmaps interfere with that process. They subvert it. They, they, and they don't help with the real problems. The real problems are not, where are we in six months' time? The real problem is, will it still work with what I have today? The real problem is compatibility, interoperability, stability. It's not, will I have feature X? Actually, no one cares about feature X. If they really do, they'll make it themselves. What they care about is it still works with what I have today. They won't say that, but that's the truth. And we had roadmaps in ZeroMQ, and we removed them. And when we remove them, things work much better. So don't make promises. Don't make promises of what you will make, of what you will do, what you'll deliver. They're, you will disappoint people. They will not trust you a second time. And you will stop other people from making stuff they could be making. Oh, it's not on the roadmap. I won't do it. So sorry. Um, I remember I was CEO of a company called Wikidot for a few years. There's a Polish company. And these guys were amazingly good at making promises. That's what they would do is just spin these great blogs with all kinds of promises and stuff they would make. And they never delivered. And they had this huge community of people who were just disappointed all the time. And at some point, there was like a revolution because they had been promising all these features which they couldn't deliver because their code base was crap. And then they made unicorns and rainbows, literally a feature on wikis to make little unicorns. And it was like revolution in the community. They were like, oh, this is it. We're not. We're going to come down and kill you guys. And I went to Poland to fix this. I spent a year there. Um, just fixing their process. And it, we stopped making promises. We just started making deliveries, just little gradual deliveries, one by one. And it got things back on, on, on the rails. Um, feature requests is the same. We, we don't have features. We don't have feature requests. We only have issues. It's either it's a problem that you can identify, you can fix, or it's not there at all. Um, you can take this further. You can say that every single change must be based on a problem. In software, you can do that, and it works quite well. And there's a process, again, I'll, you can search for this C4 somewhere, which, which works like that. It's the one that we use in our open source nowadays. So um, there's a background to software, uh, so social architecture in this book I'm writing. There's a, a kind of worked example in the ZeroMQ guide, which will be out in O'Reilly in two months' time. Um, yeah, lots of material there. So question time. Young man at the back. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that zero MQ didn't turn out to be the fastest um, messaging right. middleware layer. layer. Um, so, which is? Well, so the thing was, before I answer that, I'll just point out why it didn't turn out to be the fastest. Because in the end, no one really cared. Mm. What people really wanted more than speed was simplicity and scalability, which is a little bit different. Um, you can make faster messaging by using proprietary hardware, proprietary networks. 
InfiniBand, for example. Nobody ever made an InfiniBand driver for ZeroMQ. Not once. It's very strange, isn't it? The reason is that people who need that kind of speed, they don't want open source anyway. They want to use expensive stuff because they like spending money. Um, and they have, I don't know, they, they're, they're, all, they're all marginally criminal anyway, so they'll be, hi mom, so they're somewhere doing stuff. Open source hits people just below that who want flexibility and simplicity more than speed. And the mass of developers who, who for them, speed is, you know, 1,000 messages a second, but not 10 million. The 10 million is, 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 is the extreme thing. So commercial software like 29West, like Typico, like IBM Low Latency are faster. And they cost X thousand per CPU per, per year. You know, X is 50,000 or whatever it is. Very, very expensive. Is this a question? I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Or oh, that's a different question. <laughs> <laughs> Is that no, right? Just, <laughs> what, was the, what was the question, Gary? Could you please rephrase no, the question? I thought follow up on that. Okay, yes. So I, so, so I have a question. Um, when you interact with people who are outside these circles, typically sort of the traditional um, uh, managerial styles and workflows, right. do, they talk, do they take notice of, of what's going on in this type of dynamic and ask you, Peter, help us understand how to be more of this, or, or is there sort of a still a, a big wall between these two, two parts of humankind? So I've spent the last year and a half working in a company where we actually did it all like this, and we were lucky. We were lucky to find um, managers internally who were younger, who understand open source more intuitively, I would say, um, and who had nothing to lose and we're willing to bet on this way of working. And we actually use this in commercial software development very successfully. So for example, the notion that a bunch of engineers will self-organize around problems. We use that and it worked. And we've trained teams to use that process and they use it and it's sticky and it grows. And they end up making products which are surprisingly good. Where before the same people were making really, 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 really shitty products, like really bad products. You would look at them, you're like, what is this? Who, who, who made this? Who authorized this to be published? It's so embarrassing. The same people organize differently, make stuff that you look at and say, wow, this is really nice. Who, who invented this? Who's a genius? There's no genius. It's just a group of people working differently. So the notion of self-organizing around problems rather than being driven towards, you know, towards goals seems to work very well. Whether this is wider scale, I don't know. I suspect that it's in companies where they have a much more dramatic um, outcome. Um, if you're guaranteed of budget for the next five years, you're not going to be revolutionary in any way at all. So the teams we worked with were always on the knife. You don't succeed, you're fired, kind of thing, within the next three months, one year, very short term. So they were taking, taking the risk happily. And we've produced a closed source version of the process. Um, it's, it's a PC3, it's called, and it's very similar, but it's aimed at a closed source. It still requires GitHub, the private GitHub. Of course, not GPL licensed, it's just commercial, just normal, normal copyright, but very similar process, and it seems to work very well. Um, basically, you take a product, you make a first version of it, you throw it as a bunch of testers, people using it all the time and they're finding problems and they're reporting problems on an issue tracker. You have a bunch of developers, you throw the issue tracker, and the ones that don't perform, you get rid of. It's that simple. And you keep bringing in new developers and see who can hook into problems. And the ones that solve the most problems, they get the most something, the most credit, the most bonus, whatever it is. And the ones that don't, they get removed gently. And these developers don't get told what to do. They just organize around the issues and there's a certain methodology in how you express the issues. It's always a problem. You don't specify a, a solution. You always say, this is my problem. I can't do this. I want to do that. 
and then there's some discussion, and then there's a pull request, and it's merged, and that's it. And we get something very similar to what we have in ZeroMQ, where the master version on GitHub is basically production ready all the time. It's very weird. Little patches, which are carefully thought at, each patch affects one issue, gives us a smooth development process. There's no design process. There's no testing process. It's continuous testing all the time and continuous design of little features one by one. Each problem is being solved. And the master version is pretty much always stable. This is really amazing, but we're shipping on this company. I can't specify, but they make smartphones. And we're shipping this software on every smartphone that comes out, and they make hundreds of models. Every week, there's a shipment. The master version is being shipped. It's really quite stunning. And this is in a company which has no software engineering skills. They're incompetent, world-class incompetent, making this amazing software. So yes, this is, this is used successfully in closed source, but maybe not everywhere for a while yet. I think as open source becomes a dominant theory of how to make software, this will become inevitable. People will want to use techniques they've seen, they've used elsewhere. I think most software engineers will use open source and contribute to open source as part of their education, and they'll bring it into their work inevitably. It will take time still. Yeah, that's all right. So I'm a little bit alarmed that um, you say that it's meant to be self-organizing within a uh, company right. environment. Um, and yet, OK, you, you do kind of have to throw developers at it. Um, you say, well, work on this project, please. So there's obviously, there's obviously two cases. One is pure open source, and one is commercial development. And commercial development, you have money, you have budget to spend, and you have certain goals in terms of shipping software, right? So you're trying to put your money and turn it into, sh into software somehow. Uh, with the open source, it's a little bit different, similar in some ways. You have money or your time, investment, and you have some goals. But you're going to bring in many, many people to help you in those goals in one way or another. So it's a, it's a little bit different. Leverage is different, right? The leverage is, is much more indirect, much more longer term. You can't tell people, hey, we'll go and work on this. So the developers that you're paying on the one hand, you can say, look, here's an issue tracker. This project really is important for me because its mission is important for me. Now, how I get there, I don't know. I, said, I don't have any idea how we're going to get there. But here it is. Look at the issue tracker. What can you do? And if the developers say, no, it makes no sense to us at all. We don't like it. Then you're like, OK, I have a problem here. Either I have very bad developers, or they're telling me that my, my mission is bad. If they can work on some issues and make some, some changes, and it kind of starts to fit with the people trying to test it and use it, the process can carry on. But what they actually make every day, what they actually do, you don't tell them. You don't have to. They should be able to think about it themselves work it out as they would in open source, argue, come to a conclusion of what's the best, the simplest. And because they're under pressure to deliver quickly, and they haven't got six weeks to make an amazingly big thing, they'll make little changes. And little changes are much easier to judge, to fix, to test, to check than big changes. So they're self-organizing within a certain domain. You're not paying them to go and work on some other project. They are working on this particular problem that you've defined for them. For example, with ZeroMQ, we have a mix. So there are people I pay, and I work myself on ZeroMQ, with very specific goals. You know, our goals are things like bug fixing. So there are still historic bugs which people can't fix. Nobody will be able to find them. And so there's a small team that works on those. When it comes to adding in new stuff, making you know, exploratory stuff, we don't do that. We basically stay away from that and let other people think about that. All right. Oh, I was thinking more, uh, say your company has two or more products. I mean, right. you know, my, my reaction to self-organizing developers would be that they choose what projects they want to work on. Sure, absolutely. Um, would that be a part of... Yeah, uh, that would make perfect sense because a normal company will have lots of products. Um, I mean, we have, I don't know, we have five or ten at any, any time, any point in time. We don't know which ones are going to be successful. We don't know which ones are really worth working on. But everyone has an opinion of that. And the 
collective opinion is probably much more accurate than my opinion. So if I'm the guy that finds it or starts it, I have a very biased point of view. I will lie to myself all the time. And if I get my buddy to tell me, he will lie to me, just make me happy. But some group of people thinking about it will come to a much more accurate understanding. Um, not just developers, but people who can also you know, use it, download it, try it, get involved. So the self-organizing is also pull as well as push. It's, it's, I like that product. I want to try it. Yes, I'll make an issue on it. There's a product there that no one's making issues on. It's probably dead. Probably no one's using it, so why would you work on it? And developers can judge where their interests lie. If I work on that product, it's good for my career. That's probably a good sign as well.